Beauty, we're going to talk to our guests now. We're very excited about this. We're talking to Celine Haliwa. I hope I pronounced that correctly. She is the CEO and founder of Loyal, which is like a biotech startup developing drugs to increase. And the people, you, if you're watching this at home or you're listening to it, you're going to freak out. <laughs> to increase the health span of the most beloved things in your house. And it's not your children and it's not your spouse. <laughs> your dogs. Your dogs. Celine. Welcome to the program. Thank you. This is a biotech startup mm -hmm. that is looking to increase the lifespan of dogs. And one of the most heartbreaking things that people go through is the loss of their dogs. Lifespans between yeah. sometimes six years to maybe 15 years to 18 years if you're incredibly lucky. What? How? <laughs> why? <laughs> what? How? Why? I mean, it's a good first question. Um, wow. I'm really interested in general on working on problems that are the combination of sounding incredibly crazy to the point that when I started Loyal about three years ago, I was actually embarrassed to say the phrase dog longevity. What is your, what is your background in terms of work or education or those things that would put you in a position to make people's dogs live longer? <laughs> Yeah, so I, I grew up in Austin, Texas. Uh, I'm half Jewish Moroccan, half German, uh, first okay. gen. We grew up with 15 cats, you know, multiple dogs, a dog named Highway that we rescued off the highway, three different puppies sure. that were puppies that we rescued we found on the street. Um, we used to take care of gerbils and turtles and squirrels okay. and grackles with broken, broken arms. So you were that so, house? You I were, was that you house, were the, yeah. The refuge. You were the wild refuge. Yeah. Uh, I'm, house. <laughs> yeah, we had we had a lot of animals, and so the the animal side has been there since day one. But I definitely did not grow up thinking I would start a company or a biotech company or work on dog longevity. Uh, I actually got to college for art school, but then the <laughs> summer. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I got into college. So you're not got... like are are you a biomedical engineer, I neuroscience? Am... You are I a biomedical engineer. I got Holy there, shit. yeah. All right, let's go. Here, so I, I got a full scholarship to UT Austin for art. Okay. And then the summer before I started my undergrad, I decided to do an internship in a neuro-oncology clinic, uh, in part because I was actually really fascinated by MRIs. I thought they were very beautiful, the ability to see the inside of a, a body. Sure. No, uh, how, what 17-year-old kid <laughs> isn't fascinated by MRIs and neurological oncology. That's, you know, I've, if I've heard this story once, I've heard it a million times. I, I kind of, I don't know, when you're 16, 17, 18, you kind of think that the adults can always fix everything. And I realized that with most diseases and kind of, you know, spoiler alert, most age-related diseases, there isn't anything anybody can do for you, no matter how much effort, time, Wait, care what? you put into the problem. Yeah, sorry, man, I know your birthday oh, was yesterday. Is... <laughs> Jesus, this is I'm, this is the wrong time for me to be having this conversation. <laughs> I think this but, is the uh, right time to be having this conversation. Well, you're probably right. You know, I am. I just figured this out. I think I am 420 in dog years, if we were counting. Well, Elon That's would like that. Seven. <laughs> he would. He would like that. He would. He's he's going to save us all, or or make sure we have free speech while we while we age. I mean, we'll definitely be able to talk about dog longevity on Twitter. <laughs> no question about that. You, you get involved with sort of this idea of you're watching. Uh, uh, a geriatric process or a, a disease process, and you're thinking to yourself, well, well adults can't fix this. Uh, and then th this, this puts you in the mind space to focus on biomedical engineering when you go to UT instead of art. And you take up, you're, you become a, a neuroscientist. Neuroscience and chemistry double major, yeah. Sure. No, you can't have one without the other. I wouldn't. I was not. not suggesting that you would go into neuroscience <laughs> and not have a chemistry double major. I know you're not a slacker. So, uh, so, so you do that. You get out, uh, and, and do you go immediately to uh, this idea of starting a company to keep people alive, or was this always about animals and dogs? No, John. So it's a lot more complicated than that. Well, I would think so. You're a double major, for God's sakes. I picked neuroscience because it was the class where the like neuro 101, they'd be like, yeah, we don't know how any of this works, but it's important. And I was like, great, that's where I want to be. And 
I started working in a lab in uh, Southern California and we were working on, or the lab I was joining work, was working on uh, basically replacing, so people have Parkinson's disease, the disease is primarily driven by a loss of a certain type of neuron. Mm -hmm. um, neurons that produce dopamine, which are kind of popularly known as like, you know, happiness, but it's also actually really important for movement. I see. And so they were so trying that, to- Is it providing like the liquidity of your neurons? Is that the, is that um, what we're dealing with? I, I will make no comments on <laughs> finance or fintech, uh, mm -hmm. but it's more around the idea that it rewards the uh, the, in the correct intention, right? So when you see somebody with Parkinson's, they often will I be see. catatonic okay. or trembling. And it's right. in part due to these kind of misfirings and loss of firings of the the movement uh regulation okay. but that's all to say we were working on replacing those neurons and it was just such a hard problem right you had to like source ner you had to source the stem cells you had to put them into the patient they had to not be a you know they had to turn into the right kind of neuron they have to you know re neurons uh, have these like long uh branches where they all kind of bind you're talking to about that what are you talking about the dendrites is that what we're talking about yeah mm. look at you what Axons. <laughs> Got um, some myelin sheath going. Man, uh, that's all I that's all I eat. So you you're trying to figure out these these problems. How does that get you into the space of of aging? Yeah. So long story short, I just realized it's like why are we trying like obviously it is very worthy. We will always work on helping people who are at the end stage of a disease. Mm. But why were we trying to help these Parkinson's patients after they had already lost a significant amount of their neuronal mass? Uh, of their of their brain function, right? It just mm. seemed like such a hard problem. So I got really interested in, okay, well, why aren't we looking earlier? And, and why aren't we looking at prevention? Why aren't we looking at reducing the risk of developing it? And long mm -hmm. story short, this all kind of brought me to this field that I thought was crazy for a couple of years. It took a little while to convince me uh, of research around understanding the ways we age and specifically the ways we age unhealthily over time and how the processes by which our bodies age lead to the diseases that we've classically defined today. Does now, that make sense? Are, does this put you into the Silicon Valley transhumanist movement? Like, does this, <laughs> do you end up like draining the blood of adolescents to like feed into Peter Thiel's eyes? Like how, that, that's only, that's Peter's thing. <laughs> That's Peter's thing. That yeah, is that is not that. the standard issue thing in Silicon Valley. But there is, so you're in this whole movement now about aging. And is that the sort of, I made a telomere uh, not unravel and so a nematode can live forever? Like what's, well, I what is that? Well, I actually have <laughs> one of those tattooed on my arm. So this is a C. Nematode? elegans. A <laughs> nematode? <laughs> All right, that's commitment right there. And a black six mouse, which is the kind of classic research animal. Um, and then sure. a black Labrador, which is the first dog that they showed lifespan extension No, that's in. the, the I have the same open mic <laughs> night and then move on to MTV and then, yeah. So we all have that that process. So so you get into the aging thing and, mm -hmm. and but why then dogs? You're So the idea yeah. is you're at this foundational point uh, transhumanism or the anti-aging movement or any of those things, there's an enormous amount of energy and money behind that. Mm -hmm. What made you then flip to dogs? Is that, are they a great analog for human genomes? Are they something uh, close, not close? What, why then? Yeah. I mean, so there was two, there was two drivers. One was the push, the pull of dogs and how dogs age and the science of dog aging, but also and the push the and they're the best. And, and like, yeah, I mean, I, I have a best. soft spot for old dogs. Um, yeah. they're the best. <laughs> I think they're cuter than puppies. Uh, controversial opinion, potentially. We'll see. Um, that's going to, that's going to get spammed on. The, yeah. 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 Okay. Celine, how did you get canceled? Oh, well, you know, yeah. I think old dogs are she, cuter than how puppies. How dare she? She's out. <laughs> Uh, Boom. So, so you're you're in this this movement about aging. Do you come up with a discovery that makes you think, oh, here's a mechanism by which aging occurs? I think if we interrupt it there, we can extend life yeah. in a dog. Okay. So, so, so 
it was two things. It was two things. We okay. So the 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 push away was that. So there there is this industry as you you know you're talking about around trying to understand aging and longevity and lifespan extension. But fundamentally, Mm -hmm. every single company and group, including the ones that have like a billion plus dollars, looking at you, Calico, uh, it's Google's big aging thing. Oh, they're not actually trying to develop drugs for aging. They are like looking at aging and they're developing drugs for cancer or osteoarthritis or ocular diseases or what have you. And so I was- So they're they're looking at the effects of aging when you're looking at actually the aging process. Well, so my my thing, so for context, I just, I, I, I had done a bit of grad school in England, came to Silicon Valley. This was like my first introduction to the Valley, uh, which (laughs) is a funny story for another time. The Valley is the coolest and weirdest place in the world. And I was there and I was like, why is nobody trying to actually get a drug approved for aging itself? Like, why are we, you know, targeting these end stage diseases? Why aren't we just targeting, you know, you you living a longer, healthier life? You want to go to the root of the problem. I want to go to the root of the problem. And then so I started in people because that's where I was been working. But I kind of quickly realized that it wouldn't, unless I had a billion dollars or more, and even then, honestly, I didn't see a way to develop an aging drug for people because fundamentally people live a damn long time, right? Like if I if I gave you an aging drug, it's going to be, you know, 20, 30, 40 years before I know, um, I might be flattering you a little bit there, <laughs> whether uh, the drug worked or not. I, I, didn't, um, I didn't need to know that. Sorry, that man. Last part. Sorry, man. No, it's, I get it. It's, <laughs> you're not telling me anything I don't already see every morning. So not to um, worry. But it's all about like we... It just is way too long of a feedback loop. So I was like, okay, how can we have a shorter feedback loop? How can we get the first of a drug approved, you know, for aging, for lifespan extension? And it was at the same time that I was thinking about this problem that I was just reading into dogs and how dog ages and specifically how big dogs age. Mm. Uh, So you referenced it earlier, but some dogs might only live six, seven, eight years of age, the bigger they are. Sure. Your your Great Danes, your... Isn't that counterintuitive that the larger mm-hmm. dogs? I was always under the impression that larger mammals lived longer and that the little mammals lived shorter because of their metabolisms, that they they process everything so quickly. So isn't that why when you're doing, you know, people study in labs that the fruit fly was such a, you know, such a tremendous mutagenic study because you could go through like 10 generations in a weekend? Uh, exactly. It is. But the opposite happens in dogs. And yeah, there's actually like at that. the edges a 2x difference between the average lifespan. So, you know, a Great Dane might live six to nine years and they actually age faster too. Like a three to four year old Great Dane will start going gray in the muzzle already. While wow. a Chihuahua will live, you know, 15, 17, 18 years. And some people say it's just fueled by spite and that might be potentially true. But if you actually look into the genetics of dogs and dog size, and this was kind of the aha moment for me, uh-huh. we... So there's no one gene that controls, you know, the size of a human and being, you know, six and a half feet tall isn't going to make you live a much shorter life than, you know, being five and a half feet tall. But oh. if you look into the, the <laughs> genetic. <laughs> that actually makes me sad because I, I thought that was the only advantage I had. I thought lo- you, lower center. Are you yeah, Ashkenazi a... or are you Sephardic? Oh, I don't. Uh, uh, Ashkenazi, I believe, right? Isn't that Eastern European? Eastern yeah. European is Ashkenazi. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah that's right. I ask because there's actually- You're not going to tell me when I'm going to die, are you? No. Is this, is this going <laughs> to get is, super this is weird? News. This is good news, All John. Right. There's some longevity centenarian genes in Ashkenazis. So actually- Boom! Yeah. So this all comes together because right. the genes that control dog size and specifically make big dogs live a shorter life- uh, Right is all connected to one of the most well understood and OG longevity pathways there is. Because the first time they showed was a single gene mutation that they could make a worm live longer. They made that worm genetically like a chihuahua. And the inverse was true too. Get the fuck. So let me ask you a question though. So if they, if so ethically, you know, extending a nematode isn't necessarily going to burn out societal resources or a chihuahua. But we all know where this is going. So once you figure out how to do it with a chihuahua, there's no question that people are going to be banging down your door going, make this into a gummy and give it to me now. <laughs> there, there must be. Yeah, probably. I mean. That's got to be the end game. So when did you start? Have you tested this drug on a dog? 
Uh huh. We actually dosed our first companion dog uh, a couple weeks ago, and we've shown age-related disease or age-related negative impact benefit in dogs treated with our drug. Get okay. Yeah. This is where the rubber meets the road. So yeah. you've given this dog. It, not only does it. Well, it's only been a couple of weeks. So I don't know how you figured something like that out, but the idea would be that it's not even just suspending the aging process, you're rolling it back in a dog. So we we have shown, so we've, we dosed the first companion dog with specifically our, our second drug program that's for dogs of any size, mostly any size, any breed who are already showing signs of aging. And in our first mm -hmm. drug program is trying to make bigger dogs have a longer lifespan by correcting for, uh, what we, basically when people were breeding for size, they it, our thesis is that they accidentally gave dogs an accelerated aging disease, basically the things that control the dog growing really quickly in puberty, wow. don't fully turn off, then the dog ages at a faster rate and right. dies sooner. Um, and this is where it all connects. So the Ashkenazi uh, mutation makes the, uh, that some Ashkenazi Jews have, makes them more <laughs> like the Chihuahua. And they actually are shorter too. <laughs> well, I got that. That's for sure. So uh, let me ask you this. Are you testing it on uh, good boys and bad boys or just good boys? All of them. All dogs are equal to us. Cute dogs, so all, uncute dogs. So they're all every, they're all good boys. You're saying all, what you're saying is good all dogs go to heaven, but yeah. you would just like to make them go a little later. You would and like a little bit to... happier, right? So it's not just about like the aging field has such a right because our that... listen hip dysplasia. The the breeding mm -hmm. on dogs has been astronaut. I mean, we've mm -hmm. we've done so many weird things to them, yeah. and created all kinds of, of of issues. The idea that this could help them have uh, more healthful lives is man. Well, that's exactly it, right? Like when we like, it's not like we domesticated the wolf and a pug popped out, right? Like they, we created all of these dog breeds because we wanted dogs that were, you know, protectors like my Roddy, uh, right. protectors like your Pity, or you know, whatever other breeds we wanted retrievers. But this had genetic consequences on these right. dogs, and one of them is that the bigger a dog is, the shorter their lifespan is. And so but we are trying to fix it. What? What? So the idea that there's a pit, like. This is the holy grail of of the human condition. I mean, I, I assume you're you're aware that you were on the tightrope ethically and otherwise, but but this is the holy grail that mm -hmm. man has, you know, Ponce de Leon was searching for the fountain of youth. Like this is what everyone has for God's sakes, Walt Disney froze himself for this moment. <laughs> I have a friend working uh, on that too. <laughs> Oh, for God's sakes. <laughs> Silicon Valley is the most fucking weird place. Oh, yeah. I totally. can't even imagine <laughs> the messianic tendencies of that entire region. But 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 the gravity of this has that and the idea that it's a pill seems yeah. crazy to me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what does the pill do? <laughs> so the first one, the one for big dog short lifespan, we're basically so we're basically the thing that drives the dog to grow mm -hmm. faster. We're just trying to turn that off or turn it down after the dog is fully grown. So we don't, we're not shrinking the dogs or anything like that. We're not making medium Danes. Wouldn't that already be turned off once they, once they grow? It should be. It, it but should it be, but it's not. It stays, it's not. Yeah. I see. And so you're that, that part of that process, you're going to try and turn down. Yeah. So we're basically damping it down. So we're making okay. a, the, the biology of a Great Dane look maybe more like an Aussie Shepherd or a medium sized, sized dog. So we're not going to make these Great Danes live till, you know, a Chihuahua's lifespan. I think that's right. pretty unlikely. But hopefully we can add a few more healthier years and specifically help them be active longer. But that people don't have that 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 mechanism going. So that's not what what's the other pill? So that was actually the thesis. So we wanted to start with something that connected something the world already understands and knows, which is genetic diseases, and spe right. specifically genetic associated diseases in dogs because of inbreeding. Um, so you mentioned hip dysplasia before, that's genetically controlled. So that's why we started there, right? Because we're introducing something really weird. We're like, hey guys, we're getting this drug approved, hopefully, uh, for aging and nothing else. But don't worry, it's around things that you already understand. It's around genetics and all of that. Our mm -hmm. second drug 
exactly as you said, we wanted to be more broad, something that's more broadly applicable and something that's also will teach us more about how humans age and how other organisms age. And so this one is looking at metabolic fitness and specifically the reversal and the halting of metabolic decline um, as an animal gets older. Uh, the other thing it's looking at, what's really interesting is, so if you look at an older, some older individuals will often have very skinny legs, but in a bigger belly. Um, with age, you actually get a redistribution You know, the belly, by the way, is, is almost entirely pie. I don't know if you knew that. As you age, generally the legs stay the same, but the midsection begins to fill with a variety of pies. Pumpkin pie? Apple pie? The actual breed of the pie is not the question, but it's merely mostly pie. Mm, okay. at, at least in at least in my case, it's. I really like pie, so <laughs> that sounds there's, that sounds great to me. What's not to like about if you could if you could create a pill? This is the next project that could make short people live longer and somehow be impervious to pie. <laughs> then you'd really have something. <laughs> Are you gonna you here, Celine? You you've mm -hmm. got to answer me this. Yes. This seems so crazy. I just want to make sure, like, I'm not going to read about you three years from now going to jail. Like, I don't. Uh, I mean, I don't, me too. I could not handle jail. <laughs> I don't want. I don't want this to be one of those situ one of those Silicon Valley situations where they're like, she's a super genius. She's got a pill that makes you younger and her own Bitcoin, and everybody's going to be like, she's a huge billionaire, and then it's all going to turn out that, you know. You actually did just go to art school and you really don't know anything about anything. <laughs> no, 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 no. So right. I, there's a, this is actually something I care a lot about because it's, look, Silicon Valley is weird, but Silicon, like I always say that I feel like despite the fact that I am a woman, I have some of the biggest balls with the people I hang around, right? Right, Because right. they all, they're like these giant brains and super talented and have all the opportunities in the world and they go work on increasing revenue of like some stupid B2B SaaS product or whatever. And I think it's actually right. really important that if you have the skill sets, the desire, the opportunity that you work on things that help push forward humanity and help push forward things that will right. materially impact society. And so are there I- any break, Can I ask you, are there any breaks in Silicon Valley? Like I wonder sometimes, because you know, I think about like artificial intelligence. We've been warned since Asimov that artificial intelligence is going to be the thing, you know, rise of the Terminator. And uh, it, it's it's going to become sentient and it's going to destroy us. And so far, all we figured out how to use it for is like recommendations for who to follow on Twitter. So like, are, are there people there who are focused on the consequences of this ambition? There's so much ambition in Silicon yeah. Valley, and there's certainly an incredible amount of intelligence and money. But is there anybody in the room who raises their hand and goes, wouldn't that blow up Sacramento? Like, how, how much of, of the ethical and larger consequence is taken in? Or are people so enamored of the possibilities that it's actually a dangerous place. I don't think it's a dangerous place, but I do think, mm -hmm. I do think there has been, so one of the things when I decided to build Loyal is I wanted to align my economic incentives with something that would also be positive for society. And I think that's something that you don't often, so for example, if I, you know, if we are successful and we do get this drug FDA approved for lifespan extension, we will mm -hmm. make more money if your dog lives longer because your dog will be on our drug longer, right? We are we are aligned with your dog living a longer, healthier life, even if I'm just this cold capitalist who doesn't give a shit about dogs. Mm -hmm. uh, versus, for example, you know, Zuck, I don't think when Zuck was in his dorm room, he was like, yeah, I want to, you know, destabilize international politics and election integrity, right? No, but that's the my point. Unintended, I, I guess my point is how many people in the room, if you were looking at it, how many people in the room are, are on the unintended consequence beat that that basically game out as everybody's gaming out the process? Like if we gamed out this drug, right? If this works, which by the way, like I've got a 13 year old dog and an 11 year old dog. And like, if this works and God, it better fucking work soon for, for these guys. But like, and then people get it. 
the unintended consequences, people are, we're generally locusts to begin with. And if you, if you take an 80 year old and put them and make them all hundred or 120, like clearly we're going to have a resource problem in this world. I don't think that's true though. So I, I would actually push back on that. So it's the, when people think about aging drugs and extending lifespan because of the yeah. way a lot of age related disease drugs work, like let's think about chemotherapy, right? Chemotherapy in most cases does not extend your quality of life as much as more around, you know, the number of years of the, the patient has. Right. Uh, it, try, it tries to balance killing the cancer with killing everything else around it. Yeah. Right. But that's not how an aging drug works. It's not pulling out the last unhealthy years of a person or a dog. It's extending the healthy middle years. And so a society where you have a more productive class that's able to work, that's able to take a second career potentially. Or like, for example, my, um, my before Obamacare and all of that, you know, mm -hmm. not everyone in my family had had health insurance. And I had pretty bad health insurance and okay. I had a lot of medical debt for a long time. And thank God I was able to come to the Valley and I was able to pay it off. But like right. things like medical debt or my you know, parents being ill or being financially responsible, they disproportionately impact people who don't come from, you know, financially strong backgrounds. Because it's not like like, you know, you know, if I But you do realize it, like this will this will there's no question that a drug like that will be more available to I don't the think wealthier. Actually. Oh, Celine. No, no, no. We are, you know what we are right now? We're so in between utopia and dystopia. And that that's, this is the, I feel like we're all in like an Aldous Huxley novel right now. So, so you're saying there is a utopia and I'm saying we'll turn it into a dystopia, Celine. That's what we do. I mean, I know people suck. Uh, so for. <laughs> <laughs> all right, but you want but them to suck longer. <laughs> I want them to suck less. So uh, one All of right. my pet theories, actually, to go on a okay. little bit of a tangent, and I'm going to answer no, your no, economics no, question, yes. is, you know, one of the, the challenges of society is like you kind of have this crystallization at each generation, right? Of, okay. You know, their biases and the way they view their world. And I'm really curious, like, what would an aging drug do to cognitive flexibility? Like, is there a world where the biases of the generations, you know, one above us, actually mm -hmm. can be relearned and that it's not inherent that you have to hold on to the biases of the generation that you were raised with. And the reason I bring this up is because one of the studies we looked You're at- You're saying this is a drug that actually alleviates prejudice. I don't know, but it could at least facilitate potentially, like I'm not saying our drugs necessarily do this, but one mm -hmm. of the things we look at is uh, cognition in aged dogs treated with our drug. Right. And one one of the ways you actually the one of the things that changes the most was age related cognitive decline in dogs, which by the way, dogs do get dementia, is the ability to relearn uh, something. Right. Oh, so they'll you know, learn. I think there's a, I think there's a saying about that. Yeah, exactly. I believe we, I believe there may be something that has crystallized around that. that potentially. Yes. Potentially. Yes. The but, difficulty of teaching. Uh, exactly. Said but dog. One of, but yeah. one thing is we're looking at teaching these like old dogs is seeing mm -hmm. whether a, uh, an aging drug that impacts cognitive impact helps those dogs learn new tricks better, faster. I, I would think that would absolutely. I mean, I think it's been pretty clear that that as you age, uh, it becomes more difficult to make those kinds of connections. You know, uh, I tried to learn music at 50, right? Yeah. Uh, I'm getting my ass handed to me by 13 year olds in music class. Like they're yeah. just, they just pick it up quicker. They have it, it, you know what it is? It's a fluency that is harder to happen uh, in, in your brain. But I guess the, the, the one thing I wonder is, would we be unleashing the part of our society that has already accumulated the most resources in our society? And would we be putting our younger members of the society at even more of a disadvantage by competing against super people at 70 or 80, as opposed to, they got a hard enough time climbing the ladder. Should, should older people not bow out necessarily, but you, you, you get my point. I totally get your point. So the we, we we didn't quite get to this but okay, okay after i after i did the the stem cell parkinson's work i actually started a phd at oxford because i was interested in exactly this question because i was 
pissed, honestly, that mm -hmm. I had at that point at least $30,000 of medical debt and not to mention all the medical care you don't get when you know you have to pay a shit ton just to right, like go right, walk right. in, right? Yes. And I was like, screw this, like screw uh -huh. the US, I'm going to Europe, I'm going to the NHS and I'm never gonna have a medical bill again, right? And so that I went to Oxford because I wanted to study the differences between the NHS, you know, single payer healthcare system where the incentives okay. are aligned, right? The NHS cares about your healthcare now and also in 30 years from now versus Correct the US where there's more money to pay per patient, depending on the kind of care you have, right. but they're not not a lot of long-term incentivization. And I bring this up because there is absolutely, I 100% agree, inequity, well, obviously I agree, inequity in healthcare access in the US. And actually it's some of the worst inequity is in around how we treat age-related diseases. There are these, these cancer drugs and new CAR-T therapies that are you know half a million dollars. Not to mention you have to be able to access this very specific facilities where this happens. It's Insane. Oh, look, and, and we're dealing with now, you know, basically our, the industry around elder care is basically parking lots. We basically find lot, you know, you go to these facilities if you can afford it. But other than that, like it's parking lots, like they place you in a room and God bless the people that do their best to take care of them yeah. and, and their families. But like, People struggle with resources, and as you get older and you're no longer able to provide those resources, you know, as that space expands of the amount of time you live without being able to do that, uh, without being able to, to earn your own uh, keep there, it becomes more and more fraught, I, I would think. It's terrible. It's absolutely terrible. But the- Did you find the NHS had a better system on that? Um, I don't know about elder care. So I was really interested in the preventative care before the person became became right. ill. And so that's how I think about aging drugs. I'd, so there are definitely groups that are working on super expensive types of aging drugs that, you know, if they ever make get approved, are going to be a million dollars, half a million dollars. And I agree there will be inequitable access to those drugs. One of the cool things that about at least how we're trying to approach it is that we're looking at preventative medicine and specifically like one me way to think about it is statins. You know, a, a large portion of the mm -hmm. uh, adult US population is on statins to reduce their risk of future cardiac events. That's what I think an aging drug should be. It should be a cheap I daily see. pill that somebody takes to reduce their risk of a future disease that would be and, and extremely with, with expensive the, to take care of. The lesser side of a statin is a relatively safe uh, yeah. drug with, with very few side effects. Yeah. And, and you're, you're anti, you know, when, when they talk about certain Alzheimer's drugs, they're like, now there is uh, one thing that does happen is your brain seizes and then your nose explodes and you die. Uh, so, so balancing that, I imagine, is 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 difficult. That's exactly it. Like the the safety bar is super important. So you're 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 dealing with all these ethical questions while you're also dealing with the question of is this going to work and is it going to shut off the gene you want it to shut off and open up the gene you want it to open up. And this has nothing to do with telomeres unraveling. This is literally looking at the programming of the individual species, seeing where the program advances aging and slowing that down. Exactly, we are working on slowing the rate by which an animal, in this case dogs, maybe one day people, ages mm -hmm. over time to reduce their risk or dampen the probability of a future age-related disease. But it's not necessarily metabolic. In other words, it's not like, and you can only have, if you go on this drug, you can only have half a brownie every <laughs> no. week. No. And like, because we've so slowed down your, it doesn't slow down your process no. of like other biological processes, respiration, digestion, exactly. all that other kinds of stuff. Hilariously, actually, one of the biggest flops in animal health was a weight loss drug because people like their dogs fat. <laughs> So we looked really? at this explicitly to make sure that our drug wouldn't cause weight loss and it doesn't. See, I'm the opposite. I, uh, my dogs, so every night they step up on the scale. We do like a little really? swimsuit competition. No. <laughs> okay. uh, I was going to say, John. I have a, a tripod. <laughs> One of the pities is a tripod. Oh. And so we do have to manage his weight because uh, if his he's got the one arm in the front. And so if he gets too heavy, it creates a real uh, arthritic and muscular problem in his front. So that's that's the only one. Uh, 
uh, to do there. But so have you, is this at the FDA, your, your drug or no? Yeah, so we've been working and talking with the FDA since day one. And I think that's actually been super, like one of the, like we didn't okay. want to get a drug approved. Like we didn't want to get a supplement or something that didn't require the FDA because because the field yeah, is yeah, so no, weird. No, no. You don't want this to be like a yeah. ginseng ginkgo biloba thing yeah, that's yeah, in the yeah. fucking back of a apotheca. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You want, you want yeah. this to be on the up and up. I want it to be legit. I want to prove the point that right. unhealthy aging is a disease that you can target with a drug and in of itself is worth developing medicines against. We don't only have to develop medicine once somebody uh, has gotten old and frail or developed cancer, we can develop medicines that reduce- Why do you keep talking happening. about me? That seems like it's very rude. <laughs> so so is the FDA, do they work with you? Like, do you submit to them and then they'll say, oh, this, change this, do this, this could help? Yeah, so they're actually, the, the you know, there's a lot of a, you know public opinions of the FDA. But what I've actually found in our experience with them is that they're just a bunch of scientific nerds who are excited to work on interesting problems that have good science behind them, right? Like they're never gonna prove something that doesn't work. Right. But they've also been very, to date, collaborative in helping us. I mean, cause we're, we're deciding everything from the ground up. Nobody has ever asked the question of how to extend, uh, for getting a drug approved, how to extend a dog's lifespan, how to quantify their currently current health state, Right. Uh, how do we prove yeah, what are the, that what are the metrics it? of, of yeah. aging in a dog to begin with? So that's even that's probably a difficult question. Oh, it's a super difficult question. It's yeah. like it's and you it's it's so hard when you're working on problems like this because you have to the way I always tell the teams like you have to pick which hills to die on. Right. Like we can't fix everything about how you develop drugs today. So we, right. but we also need to get that drug developed to have the right to work on the next problem in aging. And so now so you're you're in a double blind study. You're you're in a study right now where you're giving this drug to a dog and now you're testing it with, is this, because don't you have to reach certain, like the FDA has, yeah. you have to reach this level to be eligible for a double blind study or a single blind, you know, whatever it is that they're, that they're allowing you to go through. Yeah, so we, we have a pilot study going on right now in companion okay. dogs, uh, which is, uh, I believe, blinded to the, the pet parents. It's, it's not the, like the highest rigor because it's more around uh, just like learning how to run a study and making okay. sure we're running it correctly and manufacturing a drug. And then okay. we have the full placebo controlled, double blinded longevity right. and health span study that'll be starting next year. And so the time frame on uh, when this uh, might be available, all things going perfectly. And I'm not perfectly. talking about getting, yeah. All things going perfectly, are we talking about this is a three to five year process? This is a five to 10 year process? What 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 kind of time span are we looking at? Well, we're closer than that, John. Uh, so if, if everything, so actually, interestingly, one of the hardest parts of all of this, so we've shown uh, what, what we believe and what we're currently working with the FDA to, to see if they also believe, compelling reason to believe that our drug will extend d data to support that our drug will extend health spans or quality of life uh, in dogs and therefore that's extrapolatable to lifespan extension in dogs the actual rate limiting thing that's really a pain in my ass yeah. is manufacturing uh, so I, I I don't have definitive proof of this but I have a sneaking suspicion that oh. one of the reasons why the manufacturing standards for dog drugs are so damn high uh, is because people take them too uh, specifically, <laughs> the ivermectin craze <laughs> with COVID. Oh, really? And all, oh, yeah. So people would that, take horse dewormer. But isn't that that's a that's a different form of the drug? Like the the ivermectin that we use on our farm is different than the ivermectin that a person would take. Yeah, yeah. But people were buying. So I, I have a I have a horse, and I obviously de deworm my horse regularly. And when you go to Tractor Supply to buy dewormer, they mm. have disclaimers saying, "Do not oh, take I this." I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. right. <laughs> because people were taking yeah. it. Yeah, and yeah. so uh, when you manufacture a drug, you have to show that each pill is the same and it has the same amount of drug in it and it's at a high standard, there's no contaminants, and that's actually the rate limiter. So if I we have see. delays, it's most likely going to be due to we, we've never, you know, built a I see dog what drug. So they're, they're going to be looking to make sure that the manufacturing yeah. standards are, and, and in, in the way that some like supplement things are unregulated. Completely unregulated. They're, they're, you don't have to prove sure what's in them. Are. You know, you don't know if you're just so getting I mean, sawdust. Is, uh, 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 where's, where's the light? I'm coming out. First of all, how ironic that you'd be doing this in a lab 
I mean, a lot. <laughs> uh, sure. <laughs> We right. we do have something called loyal labs and like lots of little lab puns. I mean, there's just a lot yeah, of. I don't have a kid, but I'm definitely a bit of a dad. Yes. No. <laughs> Hi, I think I, I I think. Oh, is she up? Della, are you up? Come hey, here. friend. This is Della. Della. Oh hey, my come god. Come say hi to John. Look at that sweetie pants. Hey, friend. Della. How you doing? Back up. Hey, can you show your tricks? No. Sit. D nope. Look at okay. that mug. Come on, that dog is beautiful. Uh, we're, we're gonna, we'll check back in on you. Is there, is there, where's your lab? Is it in Cal are you in Silicon Valley? I'm in SF. I'm one of the last few holdouts. All right. I'm coming out there and getting some free samples. I'm gonna, I'm gonna come out. I don't know if you got them at the front desk. I'm gonna come out in that little, whatever that little basket is. You just take one, take it back to my doggies, get this thing going. Uh, but, but it's a fascinating story and I, I just, I wish you all the best. Thank uh, you. And I love the idealism of it. And I really hope you don't go to jail in three years. That's my, <laughs> that's my concern with all those people. I won't, I won't. And I, I think one of the things I'm excited to show is that you can work on ambitious, crazy problems and do it in an ethical way that helps, like, you need to be clear, like loyal you, might You can do this work. without becoming a megalomaniac? Loyal might not work. Like, you know, we, we you can't force a drug to work like i always say there's like a definite god in biology right and that the truth is right. already predetermined whether our drugs will extend lifespan or not we're just trying to catch up with biology and reality That's right. but it's important to like the company and me and the way i think about this is like we're working on developing drugs to extend dog lifespan we're not working on getting one specific drug approved and proving my thesis that i have I had it. my entire life like if I my big it. dog short lifespan thesis doesn't work sucks it's a little bit awkward you know, people are going to quote this podcast, but I don't Never. actually care, <laughs> right? I, what I care yeah, about yeah, is yeah. getting a drug approved for aging. And I think having the, the those incentives built in and also having to, the, giving the team then permission, right? right? The scientists are in, inherently honest. That's something we've seen in all of these kind of infamous crash stories. Right. It's just that they, the management, the leadership didn't give them permission to be honest. Um, and so there has to be honesty. And, and I think that's the right way to look at it, which is that yeah. life is just a biological puzzle we haven't quite solved yet. And these yeah. are and, and these are riddles and you're working on different riddles and it's exciting. I, I would and think it it's doesn't a, it doesn't help anyone if like we're, if the drug doesn't extend lifespan. Right. Like it, it, it doesn't. You know, it doesn't doesn't work. Like you can't, well, it listen, it's always work. a trade off, isn't it? Because, you know, there's yeah. a, how many how many times are you watching television? And they're like. Want to get rid of that eczema? Get ready for diarrhea and possibly pneumonia. Like yeah. there's all these side effects that occur with, with anything. It's always a trade-off. You can take this one thing and you can get the other. And, yeah. uh, but it's, boy, it's, it's, it's an exciting world to be in. And, uh, and we thank you so much for, for spending some time with us and little Della and such a sweetie pants. And uh, uh, I just, I wish you all the best. Thank you. I appreciate it. I expected her to be weirder. <laughs> like, she, I was very, like, I think thrown off by her lack of, like, you're like, oh, you're just a smart person. Yes, nice who's person. trying new things. Trying new things. If it works, it works. That's great. It's an interesting idea. We thought we'd put it through this process. Like, I think I'm so conditioned now about that part of the world from, like, the FTX thing and from Peter Thiel and from Elon Musk that like you just expect them to go, I will start with dogs and I will move my way up the hierarchy of species. Man will live to be 150. His dog, 120. <laughs> like it's just, I can't wait to see her Netflix documentary. <laughs> Can I tell you something? That's why I said to me, thinking, you go, please, tell me please tell me you're not going to be going to jail in three years. Like, that would be fucking heartbreaking. I know. Elizabeth Holmes, she ruined. Not just her, the FTX. Like, all these people, you're like, oh, this is just a fucking house of cards. The, uh -huh. whole, the whole time I felt like I was watching Bernie Madoff at a vision board party. I was like, wow, this is. Am I, was I, am I. No, Bernie no, no, you weren't Bernie Madoff. No, Am I no. the vision board? You were the host. You, you were the, I was hosting Bernie Madoff. You were, the ho you were hosting the vision board party, and she was, I, you You kept trying to tell her, like, please don't go to jail, because. Yeah, I wasn't sure what the grounding <laughs> principles of this were. It seemed like she had, you know, describing the science. But I also think that when you're a neuroscientist 
talking to non-neuroscientists, you probably choose your language carefully as to make it accessible. So I think that hesitation, I'm hoping, is less grift and more, how do I put this to a little brain? Mm -hmm. The the utopia dystopia comment uh, stood Mm -hmm. out to me. What about, uh, I'm curious, uh, what about the Silicon Valley environment scares you uh, for her? Uh, the insular. You did. You did turn into okay. a dad halfway through. Like, well, they're gonna. They're gonna do it. Please. <laughs> that, that's so. You've had a culture. Look. This is most reminiscent of the in early industrial revolution robber barons, right? Mm-hmm. Vanderbilt, Rockefeller, Astor, like all those people that accumulated wealth and power beyond what any human beings that were not monarchs had ever accumulated based on things as simple as like, what if I put fucking steam through a camshaft? <laughs> well, what would that do? Hey, hey, what if I took a water wheel and attached it to, uh, you know what I'm saying? Like a shovel. Well, yeah. uh, you know. You have so to they innovate. accumulate all this. Right. So what happens with innovation is I think they lose sight of that they are still bound by the laws of man. So like, and Silicon Valley is this, is a incredibly concentrated, it's like innovator resin. It's like at the bottom of that, remember that bong and you'd have it for like a that year and you never, <laughs> no, I'm old school. And you'd clean it out with a pocket knife and then scrape that resin out, like that concentrated, and then you'd fucking smoke that. Like that's what Silicon Valley is robber baron resin. Wow. <laughs> Nobody's is, coming with me is, on this one. This is, no, I'm with you. Oh, come on. <laughs> it, this it, is probably a bad time to pitch you my idea, which, which is, is yeah. a hat that you wear when you're yeah. getting picked up at the airport that lights up. They have those. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, ha- I, I mean, I would do this right now, except it would waste too much time. <laughs> I could run downstairs and get one. Are John, you I, serious? John, we yeah. would... We, I, I, I would want nothing hat. more than you to go get that hat right it now. It lights up so that people... Can... <laughs> All, right, hold on. All right, you guys hang in there. <laughs> yes! 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 <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he has the hat that I'm talking about. <laughs> I... <laughs> Are we just going to fast forward through this part until he comes back with the hat? No, yeah, he, he has a hat that probably makes light. But... Either way, I'm going to enjoy this. Whether he has the hat or not. Wow. I hear like clanking back there. <laughs> <laughs> what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. For the listeners, uh, John is now wearing a beanie that does, in fact, light up. He looks like a Jamaican coal miner. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Do you okay, so when do you wear this, John? Always. Always. Whenever I'm not doing a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> no, like so imagine you got to go outside at night and clean up poop. Yeah, I get it. My be- my problem is when I'm at the airport, no the person picking me up can't see me. What's that? <laughs> John is as pleased with himself as he is out of breath. <laughs> Can I tell you something that's crazy is I can't even believe I knew where it was. That's the amazing part. And you can see it has two little settings. Uh Uh-huh. It's got like three (laughs) for when it's really dark, when it's not that dark. Have you used this hat at an airport before? That's that's the thing. That's not where I use it. See, that's so it's different than my hat. My hat is It's the same fucking hat. (laughs) No, no. It's the same fucking hat. That's not bright enough of a light what, for people to see me? at the airport. This Wait. is the bright. Look how no, bright No, but this I light need is. a strobe going up to the ceiling. It, John, I'm sorry. I just want to. You'd be, be the only want... one with a hat with a light. Alexa. <laughs> yeah, that's so they'd see me and pick me up. Alexa is trying to invent an airport locator, and you yes. came with your poop cleaning hat. That's I know. Right. I should be insulted. <laughs> Not at all. I'm trying to Look raise this. money oh, for wait. my invention. Hold on. I'm at the airport right now and I need a ride. 
<laughs> All right, that would, I mean, I, okay. It's a real headlight. Everyone, uh, what a wonderful <laughs> post-Thanksgiving program. I want to thank Celine Haliwa for joining us. I want to thank Kason and Alexa for their intelligence, for their wit, and for their inventions. <laughs> uh, make sure to check out The Problem. Aaron right now on Apple TV Plus there. Uh, that's when we're going. And by the way, speaking of the show, this is an update on the Afghan episode. I don't know if you remember the, the Afghan translators that have been trapped over there, the allies mm -hmm. that we promised to never leave behind and then promptly left behind. Uh, one of the people that we spoke to on the program, Mosa, I don't know if you remember, Mosa, obviously not his real name, but we spoke to him uh, on the program live uh, from Afghanistan. We received word the State Department that he can complete his visa to the U.S. now that he and his family escaped Afghanistan. They escaped Afghanistan. Uh, they will complete, I think, their visas at the U.S. Embassy in Pakistan and then have their interview this week oh, I still... and hopefully continue their journey to the United States after that. So that is uh, a little bit of good news in a sea of nonsense. And uh, so, so we're thrilled for uh, Mosul and his family and hopefully Godspeed to them and they, and they get here. Uh, thanks again, everybody, and we will see you next week. Ta-ta. Can you believe I have this fucking hat?